In this video, I want to talk about contracts. The idea of design by contracts was pioneered by Bertrand Meyer, which is a computer scientist uh, who also created the programming language Eiffel. Um, and in this programming language, uh, that's where design, um, this idea of design by contracts was introduced. Um, the programming language Eiffel and design by contract was recognized by the ACM, with the Software System Award in 2006, and this is a big, a big deal for computer scientists, as ACM is a very uh, well-known and respected um, institution. Um, so contracts, to put it simply, are just preconditions and postconditions that you put around your code. So um, you take a function and you say, what are the assumptions, if you will, of your arguments, of your parameters, sorry, and then you also say what the client, so whoever is calling your function, should assume from the result, or can assume from your result um, that you're computing, so from the output. Uh, the former you call precondition, the, the latter you call postcondition. Um, so the precondition has to be enforced or, or preserved by the caller. So whoever is calling that function must meet those requirements. You can think of these as requirements of calling a function. In the post condition, you can think of it as requirements of the implementation of the function. So the whoever implements the function has to meet that uh, condition. So let's say you have a function that only accepts positive numbers, and the result is, let's say, uh, the square root, right? So the the post condition is that you squared the number, the precondition is that the number is positive or non-negative. Um, so whoever calls the function has to ensure that the result is uh, non-negative and can also assume that the result of that of calling that function is um, a squared, uh, the squared number. But who checks these conditions? Well, there are two options in programming languages. Uh, some programming languages do it while the program is running, um, and those programming languages will suffer some performance degradation because there is some code running whenever you call a function, uh, before and after. Um, other functions, other programming languages, perform these checks at compile time. So just by looking at the source code, they are able to confirm and, and and uh, I guess prove that the preconditions and postconditions are always met, and when they're not met, they will let the, the user know. And this is quite useful. If you think about it, a postcondition could be the correctness of an, the functional correctness of a, of a code, right? You could have a function that sorts an, uh, an array, and the postcondition could be the array is sorted. So checking if the algorithm um, is actually sorting the array is something far from trivial. So there are some languages that do so. They are mostly research languages. One is called F-star, the other is called Daphne. Um, they're very cool languages. Um, and in general, you cannot prove the correctness of al an algorithm. So there is some, um, some functionality that basically whenever you have a loop or recursion, the programmer has to annotate somehow how the correctness is preserved. That's more of an implementation detail than anything else. What I want you to uh, know basically is that pre and post conditions can be checked at compile time. And this is a very neat feature uh, as it improves the quality of your software. In Racket, however, um, these pre and post conditions are checked uh, you can add pre and post conditions to your code, to your functions, as I will show in the next slide, but these are will be checked uh, at runtime. So whenever you call a function, the pre, pre and post conditions are called. So let's look at how uh, contracts are defined in Racket. So instead of define, you have define slash contract, uh, but this is just a plain old function. However, there, there's this little arrow here and the arrow, you're going to have a function that is called. Um, so all of these functions will be called for the, the parameters. And then the, the last one is going to be called for the return value. Okay. 
So in this case, it's saying, in this case, you can, if you squint your eyes, you will just see types. So what this is saying is that the first parameter has to be a symbol, the second parameter has to be a real, and the result has to produce a string. Okay, so whenever, um, whenever your code calls f, it has to ensure that x is a symbol and y is a real, and it can assume that the result of f is going to be a string, right? So if you have a programming language like Java, Java or uh, C, uh, functions have types, right? You, you have type annotations. You say that, well, x is an integer and so on. So why this? What, so is our contracts just used to add a bit of types, typing information? And if you do that, why wouldn't you just use a, lang a typed language? Well, the answer is that in Racket, this is just a plain old function, which means that you can do actually whatever you you want. You can write any function. So the fun you can you can uh, do very complicated things that cannot be checked at compile time. So it's a bit more flexible, uh, cost of performance. Um, basically, that's it. However, you can use uh, these annotations to type to type check code. And type checking is just what compilers do to ensure that the types and the you know, whenever the type usage is uh, correct, like you like com C compilers and Java compilers do. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of, but actually this is a trend of dynamic languages such as Python and um, in this case, Racket. There are um, variations of, there is a variation of Racket and there is um, also a variation of Python where you can annotate um, your functions with types, and then there are extensions that will check, make sure that all the typing uh, is sound, right? So that your, you know, if you have a variable that is an integer, you can only pass an integer to it. So there is some, and you can do that without running, you know, at compile time. So Racket does have that support, um, and Python as well. And this idea is known as gradual typing, and JavaScript also has it. It's called TypeScript. Uh, these are all extensions, um, although in the case of Python, it's actually included as part of the language, uh, whereas with TypeScript, it's considered to be a different language. Tips, TypeScript is uh, in relation to JavaScript. Anyways, I digress. Um, so this is what we have. Finally, what I would like to show you is, is uh, a few, um, I guess, predicates that you can use as pre and post conditions. Um, what you can see here, uh, you have some th that are for the usual data types, so you can check if, and you've been using those, whenever you create a struct, you get one of those predicates, right, where it checks if the thing is uh, either a number or a value, right, we had r call a number, we check if the, the value is an instance of that struct. Um, but as you know, there's also real and uh, symbol, you've used those when you were parsing um, when you were parsing S expressions in your homework one. Uh, but there are more things. So there is um, NEC just says returns true for everything. Uh, there's list, of course, there's a list question mark. But there's something more interesting, like list of number, which is just saying if it's a list that contains numbers, and we will check and ensure that it only contains numbers. Uh, there's also cons to check if something is a pair. And then there are these combinators, which are interesting. Uh, notice that there's a slash C for contract, and it's saying that the value parameter, either input or output, is either an integer or a Boolean. And then in this one, it's saying that it's an integer, and the integer has to be even. If you think about it, checking if a number is an even number, that's not something very easy that a compiler can do. But because we're doing it dynamically, you know, when the code is running, uh, you can actually be very expressive. So that is one of the benefits of having um, this system versus a compiler. Um, you also can specify, you can say that something is a pair, and on the left hand side you have a number and a string. Again, this could be anything, right? It could be nested. You could have a number and a number and, you know, another pair inside and so on. Uh, you, there's also a combinator for hash tables, where you can say the key and the value. So that's very easy, very uh, important. Why am I showing you this? Because in homework five, I do include it. Uh, I do include um, contracts in our main functions just because it makes um, debugging much simpler. 
So because here in this course we're really more about correctness than performance, I do want to make sure that your experience while you're trying to do homework five is an enjoyable one, so I added contracts. Uh, and you can add them when you're creating functions. So if you click on that link, actually, if you follow, if you use the um, HTML version of the slides, you can follow this link, or you can just Google uh, data structure contracts in and you'll find Racket's manual page on, page on contracts. And basically what I want to look, there's, this is super, it starts with the terrible example. So maybe just look on the left hand side and you will see some interesting things. Um, ones that I find interesting is that you can, you have combinators for saying that a value is equal to some something or greater than or smaller than. So there's quite a lot of things you can do or checks you can do um, in, uh, with this with this library so it's pretty interesting and, and powerful see you can say that something is a promise of something so you could say that's a promise that contains a pair that contains something else so you could do it with this um yeah that's about it um it's basically what i want to talk about contracts uh you're going to use it if if you don't want to define functions with contracts it's fine you don't have to uh, this is just supposed to help you uh, when you when something goes wrong. So feel free to ignore it as well. But I hope you did learn did learn something, and at least you've heard of design by contract in in my course. Okay, have a good one.